Good evening, I'm Kathy Lewis, and here's what matters tonight. The state Republican convention is expected to give its gubernatorial nomination to former Attorney General Bob McDonald this weekend. And on the other side of the House, there are three candidates trying desperately to get your attention before a June 9th primary that will decide the Democratic nominee. We'll consider the prospects with Daily Press reporter Kimball Payne. We are also happy to have with us tonight Don Lozado, who's the editorial page editor of The Virginian Pilot. Vivian Page joins us as well. She blogs at blog.vivianpage.com. And Brian Kerwin is with us as well, and he blogs at bearingdrift.com. Good to have all of you with us tonight. Thanks Good for be being here. here. So, big weekend for the Republicans. Will you uh, be at the convention? No, we'll be watching from afar because uh -huh. most, of the, most of the top of the ticket is fairly sorted out. I mean, obviously, we need to wait to, for Bob McDonald to get it, and Bill Bowling has to sort it out. But uh, I'm, I'm going to watch from afar and, yeah. and curiously from afar to see how everything goes. And Brian Kerwin, you're going. Well, I'll be on what's called Bloggers Row, which is right at the foot of the stage. Uh, the Republican Party has, has really reached out to the blogging community. We we're, we're have access to our own production studio. We'll be able to shoot video and upload it from the site. Wow. Yeah, it's going to be pretty neat. Wi have you decided what you're going to be doing in, in, as, a, as a voter in this process? As a voter? Um, Pretty sure I'm with McDonald. <laughs> um, that was courageous. Yeah, I'm really reaching <laughs> right out, out there on the limb. And yeah. I've been a bowling supporter for a while. Um, and AG, and nobody believes me when I tell them I'm, I'm still up in here. I was on the phone with another blogger this morning, going back and forth, and he was trying to convince me with uh, Cuccinelli. He's yeah, a Cuccinelli so three supporter, people vying for uh, that Ken post. Cuccinelli, senator, mm -hmm. uh, John Brownlee, prosecutor, and Dave Foster, who I believe is a school board member. Um, or a former, I don't know if he's still a school board member from Northern Virginia. And it's funny, 95% of the issues, they're lockstep. And it's going to come down to probably math and, and who can turn out their base of supporters uh, and how many ballots it takes mm -hmm. to see who's going to get the nomination. I'm going to wait till I go up there and talk to all three of them before I decide who to support. And of course, there's been some conversation about Mr. Frederick, your former chairman, and what he may do at the convention. Yeah, the. Uh, he still has a little bad blood. I don't know how wide his reach is now. Most people uh, around the convention, which which we hoped and we expect, um, we're very positive about McDonald's candidacy. Everybody wants that to just kind of go away, move on, and let's focus on the November elections and anything that's going on in-house. Um, mm -hmm. Let's just come together and forget about it yeah. for now. Yeah. The question is, does Frederick want it to go away? <laughs> I'm not sure if he does, but um, you know, he could be one man screaming in the middle of 10,000 people, and no yeah. one's going to hear him. So well, what, what do you hear? The ticket yeah. wants it to go away, right? Right. Yeah, oh, and I get, sure. when I get the feeling most of the people are, are, are don't want to have a conversation about who the chairman is, they want to have a campaign for the the governor and lieutenant well, governor. Well, it's hard enough to sort through the, the top of the ticket for most of the public anyway. I mean, you right. get down to chairman. I mean, that's really the hardcore partisan insiders, the folks that are paying attention. The whole time. I mean, you, you get out into the public and people, they say June 9th primary. And I'm, I'm like, yes, yeah. it's the next fact. week. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's been very interesting because we've, uh, on the, the radio side of, of the house on our noon radio show, uh, we've been talking about this primary for quite some time, but it's very hard to get people's attention on it. It's, right? it's hard. People don't want to engage on this. I, I think it's a little bit lingering, sort of being tired after the presidential race, which seemed to go on forever. There are three candidates on the Democratic side, and th their policies are not that different. If you look at them, for example, all three of them are dedicated to transportation. All four of the candidates, well, all four of the candidates are dedicated to transportation, but all four have recently come around on nonpartisan redistricting. Right. Too. Well, and three so of them were already there, and one of them came around. One of them. <laughs> <laughs> One of them has come around recently. Oh, right, more recently. Hey, let's Good celebrate progress. Let's <laughs> celebrate progress. Even, and that's, truth be told, even I am starting to listen to the other side of the argument. We've had these conversations. Yes, we're going to freeze block. this moment yeah. and replay it. Hey, anybody want to guess times. who just came around? <laughs> <laughs> but even though Bob, is, Bob McDonald has come around, I think it's still interesting that the, the uh, center of gravity for this remains in the General Assembly. And I don't know how that's going to be very interesting to watch, how that sort of shapes up up in the next couple of years. So for Bob McDonald, this is a pep rally this weekend in mm -hmm. a lot of respects. I mean, this is the, the coronation. And yeah, it's not his official kickoff. He already had those. Um, but this is the real, this is the major leagues. Yeah. Uh, this is this is like the home stretch. So, but this June 9th primary, which is an election which I think just about anybody can vote, right? Right. Uh, right. And they're hoping people will vote, but turnout's been anticipated to be anywhere between low and very low. Uh, that's the one where you've got three men vying for the top spot on the right. ticket. 
and uh, we're talking about, of course, Terry McAuliffe, uh, the National Democratic National Committee uh, chair, former Democratic National Committee chair, big fundraiser, been going through the state, mm -hmm. working on people's roofs, working on odd jobs, <laughs> all the rest of it. Right. Yeah. Uh, and and then you have uh, Senator Cree Deeds from in, uh, from out in Bath County, uh, and then of course uh, uh, former delegate uh, Brian Moran. And and what a race this has been. I wonder, as you've been covering this, Kimball Payne, uh, it's been a, the addition of Terry McAuliffe in the race, which the Washington Post described as espresso in a state that likes its coffee with cream or something like that. It was a great way to think about yeah. it. Definitely caffeinated. Well, I mean, <laughs> listen, you, you look at it and, and you realize that we're already watching campaign commercials in May. I mean, how often in a gubernatorial right, right. race do you see... We've been watching not for longer than May. Well, I know. I mean, he's, been, who he's paying for the he's been on. He's been, on, oh, he's been listen, on the radio the last two months. I mean, on, radio, tele on television the last two months, on the radio since the date of his announcement on January 7th. The Super Bowl. I mean, but the Vivian, how much, of a, how much of a challenge is this for the Democratic Party because, you know, the Republicans have had their guy and he's been campaigning uh, to, with a November theme. How complicated is this for you to have three candidates trying real hard to get attention? It's been difficult because, of course, the dynamics have changed. And so you have someone who has a ton of money and is able to get a, able to spend his way into the public, whereas the other candidates are running much more traditional, have been running much more traditional campaigns, reaching Brian Moran has spent a lot of time reaching out to the traditional core of the party that shows up to vote in primaries. Creedis has been doing some very interesting things as far as moving around the state and getting on TV when he did and so forth. So, of course, Brian you know, him. Brian, Brian has done, I think Brian's done, done what he needs to do, but I think we certainly have seen a shift in the total, in the overall dynamic. Why else would Bob McDonald even be on television? I mean, he's not on the ballot on June 9th and he's on television. Mm -hmm. So we do have the, Terry McAuliffe has changed the dynamic. I'm not sure it's for the better, but certainly has changed the dynamic. Well, you know, it's interesting because I think last time you were here, Kimball Payne, you talked about, or, or at least you sort of posed this possibility, that Brian Moran and Terry McAuliffe would, would duke it out uh, and, and then Creed Eads would sort of quietly come up from behind and be the sort of compromise candidate in this process. And in some respects, we may be starting to, to see some of that. I mean, the Washington Post just endorsed Cree Deeds, that was interesting. That's, uh, that will, f uh, hopefully for Deeds' campaign, what they're thinking is that'll get him a second look from a lot of voters in Northern Virginia, which is big for him. But you literally saw Cree Deeds step back during one of the debates so that Brian and Terry could could kind of engage. And I think that's that's a great metaphor for the campaign because, you know, Deeds has, he's kind of deferred in a lot of cases to, to, from attacks. He's kind of deferred. And Brian has not been shy about getting aggressive and, and challenging McAuliffe because McAuliffe comes into a room and sucks the air out of it and is, is dominating. He's got, you know, 15 staffers behind him who have policy proposals on anything and everything that you want to hear about, whether it's green energy, yeah. if your baby is transportation. You know, I mean, this, this guy is, is got it locked up and knocked down, but the problem is getting back to turnout. Yeah. What you mentioned is that you look at the races in 2005 and the races in 2006, and the ones that were primaries in June had 3.5% turnout, right. 150 right. to 170,000 people right. out of 4.5 million picked who was going to go forward. So how do you split that? And and, and who gets the most people out to the polls? It's ground game. And so you, and then you look at the the primary in February of last year, the presidential primary, where we had 980 thousand people show up for that primary. I don't think anyone is expecting 980 thousand people. But there's the hope. Uh, certainly, the McCullough's plan hope is that some of those folks will come out to the polls. Um, we were laughing earlier about if it rains, then when we can look at uh, turnout being next to nothing. But it is going to be about turnout. Who actually shows up at the polls is going to be who's making this decision. Boy, no kidding. What I think was most interesting is when McAuliffe was inserted into this race, it, it became not just uh, half, a, half again more complicated. It was almost geometric. This is, this is the highest electoral calculus I've ever had to watch, and I have no idea how this is going to turn out because there's so many factors at play here, mm -hmm. including, including uh, McAuliffe's money. And yeah. as you said, I thought that was a... Great observation that Deeds stepped back. I think that's in keeping with his personality, completely. though, don't you? Completely. But, uh, but now he didn't step back completely because he was the first one to attack Terry McAuliffe on the issue of <clears throat> payday lending. When Terry McAuliffe came out and said, you know, the other guys have right. not done anything on payday lending, and when I get to Richmond, I'm going to do something on payday lending, Cree Deeds was the first one to say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. 
you know, while you were right. off playing, we were actually trying to do something about payday lending. It's nice to say that you're going to eliminate it, but in actuality, you know, we've been trying to do that. But in this so. latest flyer that, uh, mm -hmm. that, that just has surfaced today, it looks like this payday lending thing, yeah, uh, he's McCall back is still to trying that. to make yeah, with it. Yeah, yeah, he's back with it. Well, yeah. it's a great thing because when you don't have a record in the General Assembly, it's easy right. to pick and choose votes exactly. that look bad. I mean, exactly. to, you know, I, I'd struggle to find anything Terry McAuliffe has voted on. I mean, you know, other than within the DNC, which to me, the, you know, the Democratic National Committee, I, I don't know what's going on in there and policy positions and whatnot. I mean, Moran and Deeds have these extensive, mm -hmm. right. extensive voting records that you can go back in and say, well, listen, they authorized payday lending in 2002. Right. Well, everyone in 2002 thought payday lending was just sure. going to be a sort of a side business that people they could do. They thought they were going to regulate it because at that point it was unregulated. And then a lot of them and came so, back later and so said. So they really right. thought that yeah. they were doing, I was actually in Richmond when they were holding hearings in the final Finance committee, the banking committee was holding hearings on whether what they should be doing. And you remember Harvey Morgan? I mean, De yeah. Delegate Morgan right. from Gloucester is one of the guys that carried the bill. They and thought they were doing Delegate the right Morgan thing. Delegate Morgan is about as close to your grandfather right. as anyone in the General right. Assembly. And this guy came back and was like, you know, what have I done? Right. This is awful. Right. I made a mistake. You know, so. And so, every time they try to fix it, they make it worse, or they true. make it different. But it it doesn't well, go they away. They have the risks. Yeah. All right. So, well, Don, have you have you met with the gubernatorial candidates? Yes, have they come yes. and yeah. courted the editorial board, and so you get to spend some lengthy time with them? And I'm not sure courting is the right <laughs> word. I think one of them, who I won't who I won't name, uh, spent most of the time right up in the elevator, um, criticizing us for one of our endorsements. But um, we have we've had a chance to sit down with all of the candidates. It's been very illuminating. I've written a column about each. Um, as, a, as a matter of policy, we don't endorse, um, which makes us a little bit different from some of the other papers in the state. But what we are don't your endorse observations about? I mean, because what I think is, and the only reason I ask the question is, we've <clears> had <throat> an opportunity on the radio side of the house to spend an hour with each of the right, candidates, right. The, the gubernatorial candidates as well. Um, three of them were in the studio, and Terry McAuliffe joined us from Northern Virginia. And I, I just as an observation, I think it's so interesting what happens. I, I know people love a debate format, and there's certainly a lot you can learn in a mm -hmm. debate format. But I find it so intriguing to give somebody an hour's worth of airtime and just see where they go with it. Yeah. And what I find happens is it's very illuminating it is. when you get an opportunity to talk with someone uh, for, to see, how, first of all, how deep they are, how, and that sort of thing, but also when they get to say more than a soundbite. And I wonder what some of your observations well, were Well, exactly that. I mean, it's been, I, I've been impressed by every one of them uh, in, in different ways, but, you know, the depth of their knowledge um, We've I've met with Bob McDonald repeatedly over the years because he's you know he's so familiar sure. to us in Hampton Roads, and you know just the pure depth of that man's knowledge of some of the basic issues of you know facing the state is is really impressive. I think if anybody gets time yeah. enough to spend with him, they'll they'll come away impressed. And I with think that. you wrote something along the lines of it. It was hard not to imagine you might be sitting there talking with the next governor. Yeah, I mean it really kind of is. It. it really is. Um, he's, and maybe beyond. Um, you can actually go back into uh, the last four or five governors, they've all figured out where Iowa and New Hampshire is pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I wonder, Brian, as you think about this from, with, a, with a Republican, through a Republican lens, who's the best candidate the Democrats could put up if you're Bob McDonald? The question is, do you believe in what he answers? <laughs> <laughs> the, be the best, I always best tell, candidate. If I'm a Republican, yeah. and, and who do you want to run against? Who do you who do you uh, most want to run against? It's a double. Yeah. It, I don't know. I'd rather run against Brian. Brian, Brian has mm. so gone wacky left in the past six months, trying to secure some kind of a foothold in the primary, that he's just wide open. Not wacky left. Not right, by no, any stretch of the imagination. I don't mean to be redundant. Left. Two words you've never heard of. Oh, we're talking about Virginia, but we're talking but, about moving Virginia forward. Yeah. But Terry, right? Terry brings so many outside interests, brings all money from all over the, the country. The really interesting and thing about, from all over the country. about this, right. well, it's neat to talk about this governor's race from somebody who's not from Virginia. It is, it is. They look at it, the Democrats out of the state to a one, union people, people, I, I, I'm, I live in Pennsylvania, I go back and forth a lot. They, they're Democrats are nightmares. This is 1993, uh, 1992. They have Bill Clinton. They've got the House. They've got the Senate. They got the governors. They got uh, General Assembly. And then 1993 comes along. George Allen gets a foothold. 1994 comes and it's a Republican revolution, and the rebound of the GOP started in Virginia. So you think the same We're, thing might happen? I this think. Time? I think. I think a tradition holds it's going to happen this time, and the Democrats know it, and they're throwing. 
buku box that somebody like Terry McAuliffe saying, go to Virginia and make sure that doesn't Just happen again. Just hold on. Just hold on. But they're going to throw buku bucks at anybody. That's right. It doesn't matter. The Democratic Whoever's the nominee. Whoever's the nominee is going to have. That's I mean, correct. They're, they're going like to have more money than they know what to do with. It's not like if Creed Deeds wins the right. campaign, suddenly they're going to be like, all right, forget the but past the, 32 years. But the point, years, is, still, the the point is still good. There's oh, people yeah, outside of this state that are saying, you know, the only way we can afford 1994 again is to make sure that 1993 doesn't happen again. Mm. Stop it in Virginia. New Jersey's lost. And of course, there's all this conversation about, uh, you referred to the last 30 years, you know, the idea that in Virginia it seems that, if I'm not mistaken, pendulum. that, pardon me? The pendulum. The yeah. pendulum swings the other way. So you, whoever wins the presidential election the year before, the following year, uh, the Absolutely. other party gets it's in. Bush, in, one, Bush yeah. one, Kane won. It's Bush been gone one, on. Warner won. It's like you an off year election. It's like, yeah. it's like Virginia's yeah. the first off year election. Yeah, really. It's also a test, though, of the party in power in Washington. And so I think that when you look at why that's happening, you start seeing the fact that the president is in the first year, particularly when they're first term, in their first year, that first term, and people have high expectations. Mm -hmm. Barack's numbers have managed to stay in the 60s as far as approval ratings are concerned. Which is where George W.'s was the first year of his term. Uh, but once we start getting into the fall, then the numbers start falling. So I think it's critical. One of the things that dem we Democrats have to look at is not only where we are right now, but where we're going to be by the time Barack's numbers actually start falling in the fall. Huh. Because it's inevitable almost that the numbers start fall. It's also inevitable that people start thinking less if the economy doesn't turn around quickly right. enough. So we're going to be fighting. I see Bob McDonald sitting in the catbird seat. First of all, I watched him with the VA convention forum, and he sat up there and he actually invoked Obama's name more times than the three Democratic candidates did combined. Did a good job using it. Didn't he? So he gets to run with Obama as long as Obama's numbers stay high. And as soon as the numbers start falling, hmm. he gets to run against it. Interesting. So, you know, he's sitting there. And so that's what we have. We as Democrats have got to look at who is going to be our strongest candidate. Not today, but who's going to be the strongest one to run in the fall. And I who's that in your mind. Well, I posit what we're going to have in the fall, have to have in the fall is what's known as a Virginia Democrat. Someone who actually can separate themselves, if need be, from the National Party. That's what we've had in the past. That's what we've been successful mm -hmm. so with. So who is that in your mind? I think that's Brian Moran, contrary to what he thinks. But I think that's Brian Moran because I think he brings a lot of the pieces together mm -hmm. um, that we've got. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, I don't, I'll tell you who I think it's not. And I don't see how Terry McAuliffe can separate himself from the National Party come October, November. Mm, interesting. I just don't know. I think the Republicans have to be petrified of Creed Eats. I mean, absolutely petrified, because when Creed Eads ran against Bob McDonald in 2005, the NRA endorsed oh, Creed Eads. Right. It was what? The, the, it was the 300, 360, 360 on the recount, 323 yeah. in the... What, that, the, the vote in that race was something on the order of 400 votes separating but the two of them. a Democrat securing the endorsement of the NRA because of the Constitutional Amendment on hunting and fishing, whatever, whatever the course was, that muddies the middle, and McDonald is not going to be able to sprint that fast to the middle. I mean, I think that really scares the bejesus out of them. And you, you talk about 1993. The, the question about 1993 is let's look back at what has happened in Virginia outside of the gubernatorial race. Who's the DNC chair? That was a pick for a shrewd reason. Right. That is a pick because he is the head executive in this state. He knows the players. He can bring, I mean, if, if anyone can call Barry Obama on the phone and get him down to Virginia <laughs> to campaign, yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking Tim Kaine can. Right. And I'm Good thinking point. whoever the candidate is is probably going to have the benefit of a few Obama campaign events in Virginia this fall. I mean, if they really want to win it and reverse this tide, you got to believe Obama's going to have a rally down here. the interesting thing about this show. We have done exactly what everybody else has done. We spent all our time on the top of the ticket, and we were supposed to talk as well, and we want to be sure that we do that before we wrap up, about uh, the down ticket races, lieutenant governor race, and the attorney general. Well, we talked a little bit about the attorney general's race. Um, so let's talk about those, uh, because we, we should probably do that. Uh, we've got two Republicans and two Democrats. The Democratic field really has, has shrunk recently, particularly uh, with the departure of uh, John Bowerbank, right. who is endorsed, uh, who, who has endorsed Jody right. Wagner. Yeah. Right. So you've got Virginia Beach, Jody Wagner, and you've got Mike Singer. And and I, I mean, honestly, Singer Mike was, Singer is Singer a, was a former deputy counsel to Mark Warner. Right. Yeah. And and honestly, I mean, we've been paying so much attention to the to governor's race that I, I you know, they've been battling it out on their right. own and they've been securing endorsements. It's going it's to be interesting. Jody has run again. We're talking about a traditional campaign versus non-traditional. And Jody has run a very traditional campaign in terms of getting her endorsements from the party faithful. Right. And, the, and, the, and again, the primary voters. 
I'm going back to that key, going, those are the folks who show up every time. Uh, Mike has run a more insurgent campaign. Uh, picked up a lot of support. We've had we actually had five candidates in that race in, at one originally, point. Originally, yeah, so, really much. So you know, it yeah. was it was really kind of crazy. So um, I think though that you're gonna you know going looking down that corridor that you always like to talk about from Northern Virginia down. Yeah. Um, I think Jody Wagner wins. I think okay. I think that, but. We still have, the last poll showed 68% of the people undecided exactly. in that race. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and on the Republican is, side, of course, we've got uh, Patrick Muldoon and Bill Bowling, the incumbent. Right. How does and that that's, go? Uh, landslide. I, yeah. Doubt, yeah. I, I doubt if, I, I, I predict it's going to be an acclamation vote. I okay. think they're just going to get the first results in, and I think Muldoon's just going to call about, for a unanimous. And we talked about, just for the record, we talked about the three candidates on the Republican side for Attorney General. There's only one on the Democratic right. slate for that, and that's Steve, Steve Shannon Steve. from right. Fair, Fairfax County, uh, who's a former Assistant Commonwealth's Attorney. So uh, I wanted to be sure that we did that, because I knew I was going to hear from somebody who said, why didn't you talk about the down ticket races? And I, you know, there you go. Uh, so the big convention coming up this weekend, you'll be there. Mm -hmm. we'll and your... uh, it's going to be interesting, and it's really going to come down to first ballot or not. If uh, um, Everybody's going to be looking at the AG race, and the way I see it, if if Ken Cuccinelli secures 50% on the first ballot, um, obviously he's the nominee. But if he doesn't, he's toast. Hmm. Uh, I got a funny feeling the other two are going to team up and get him in the second wow. ballot. So for Ken, he's got to win the first time, or hmm. I, I don't see the numbers working for and him. And then, of course, the June 9th primary for the Democrats. We keep talking about right. this low to very low turnout. What do you think is the strategy to get out the vote? I don't think any, it's the same old strategy we've always had. A lot of phone banking, a lot of knocking on doors, a lot of flushers on, on election day, those kind of things. That's what's going to be happening. And pray that if, you know, if it rains, all bets are off. McAuliffe mm -hmm. wants rain in Alexandria and, <laughs> and Deeds, Deeds, right. Deeds and Moran want rain in Hampton Roads and Richmond, I'd, I'd imagine. Yeah. I, think, I think Terry can buy some rain. <laughs> Shoot yeah. some dry ice into the clouds? Yeah, probably. Well, we'll be continuing to keep uh, keep an eye on the race with our editorial roundtable, and uh, it's, it's always so interesting to talk with you all and get your thoughts and opinions about this, and so we'll keep checking back in uh, as, uh, well, first of all, we'll be checking back in with you on the other side of these, uh, uh, of the primary and the convention, and then maybe we can talk at that point about why one is a convention and the other is a primary, and uh, one way or the other, June 10th, June 9th, we'll know, and June 10th. The big race will begin for the fall, and we'll see how that goes. So uh, keep it right here on WHRO and, of course, at BearingDrift.com and blogspot.vivianpage.com and shadplank.com and pilotonline.com and the pages of the Virginian Pilot and the pages of the Daily Press. Did I get everybody covered there? I, I think we got them all. I'll be back in just a moment with a final thought about the uh, federal stimulus program and some summer jobs that it contains. Part of the stimulus package from Washington contains millions of dollars to support summer jobs for young people. So, brochure in hand, my 18-year-old daughter went out to apply for one of these jobs. Turns out they wouldn't let her fill out an application because while she is most assuredly low income, she is not from a low income family. It would have been helpful to see that on a brochure or on a website, but I can buy a special program for kids from low income families. The other qualifier, though, makes me very uncomfortable. In addition to being low income, she was told she also needed to have another barrier to employment, such as a basic skills deficiency, being a school dropout, being pregnant or parenting, or having a criminal record. Who knew a high GPA and a spotless rap sheet would be such a problem? When we talked about this program on our radio show recently, one employer called to share his experience with such programs. You go through a lot of kids, he said, trying to find that diamond in the rough. Well, my take is that it would be a lot easier to find that diamond in the rough if we shifted the focus just a bit. Instead of paying kids to work, why not pay these kids $9 an hour to deal with the very deficiencies that brought them to the program in the first place? Pay them to get their GEDs. Pay them to learn the basic reading, writing, and math skills they need to get these jobs without conditions. Pay somebody to watch the children of these children so they can finish their high school educations. It still sends the uncomfortable message that if you don't get it right the first time around, somebody will pay you to fix it. But at least we'd get a better longer-term payoff for our investment. This seems to be one of those programs that was established for all the right reasons, but may send all the wrong messages. What do you think about it? Send us an email at whatmatters at whro.org or join us as a fan on our Facebook page. You can send your letters to 5200 Hampton Boulevard, Norfolk, Virginia 23508 
or call us at 889-9425. Coming up in the weeks ahead on What Matters, the presidents of three local colleges and universities join us for a panel discussion on the state of higher education in Hampton Roads. We're also taking a look at the Native American population in the area and the latest on efforts for federal recognition. But whom exactly would the government be recognizing? Also coming up, exit strategy. It's that time of year again. Hurricane season begins June 1st. We'll take a look at the current plan to help get you to higher ground in case the big one hits Hampton Roads. I'm just thinking about this summer jobs thing, and, you know, it occurs to me that if you thought that boom was big, you know, the one when the meteor crashed into the bay, <laughs> wait till you hear me tell my daughter that she can earn money cleaning my house this summer. That's <laughs> going to be a big boom. I'm Kathy Lewis. We'll see you next time for another look at What Matters.